that's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Black Demon, the third film directed by Adrian Grunberg, which is being released courtesy of The Avenue Entertainment on April 28th, 2023. Do you know Adrian's other films? Uh, his first film was uh, during Mel Gibson's Please uh, Accept My Apology Tour uh, with Get the Gringo, which I've never seen. And uh, we did see... Mr. Gunberg's 2019 feature, Rambo, Last Blood. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that one. Mm -hmm. I think they should have kept the Spanish language title, El Demonio Negro. <laughs> okay, the, the story. Stranded on a crumbling rig in Baja, a family faces off against a vengeful megalodon shark. I knew from the trailer this was not going to be good, but I thought it might be fun. I ended up really not liking this movie. Unfortunately. Shocking. Shocking. Uh, the basic story is Josh Lucas plays... Uh, he works for an oil company. Nixon Oil. And they have a rig off of Baja that we're told he's supposed to go inspect. His name is Paul Sturges. And he decides to bring his family along with him, which consists of his wife and two children who appear to be like, I don't know, like 13 and 10. Young enough to be... An Annoying. Oh, they're so annoying. But the gag is Josh Lucas's character knows this rig is in bad shape. Like it's breaking all kinds of rules and not passing safety tests, but he signed off on all of them. He says because they forced him to. They basically said, like, if you don't sign off on this rig, you you don't have a job. But they're really using him as a scapegoat. They got him to sign off on all these safety things saying the rig is fine. And the company knows it's not. And they're going to have, or they have Josh Lucas at the rig because they're going to blow it up. So they want to kill him in the process of destroying the rig so that if any blowback comes, they can say, well, we have this incompetent inspector who approved it and now he's dead. So too bad. So he gets out there not knowing that he's going to die. He just knows that he's going to do an inspection on a rig that he already knew was in bad shape. And when he gets there, it is in very bad shape. Nothing's working. The entire crew's gone. And we find out that the shark... I was a little confused on what's happening because the people in Baja, like in this little town, are talking about El Demonio Negro like it's like an evil entity or a, a spirit that's protecting them. And I guess it's manifesting as this megalodon shark. But we never hear anyone talk about the shark. And even like the imagery of... Like, there, there's this shrine built to El Demonio Negro, and there are no sharks on it, so I'm very confused. And we actually don't really... I wouldn't even call this a shark movie. No, not really. We do get images of the shark underwater, and it's huge. It's big enough to uh, warrant some necessary explanations for how the water's not moving <laughs> uh, around the rig. But mainly, I would call this, like, an environmental thriller, maybe? I'd call this trash. Because the entire hour is Josh Lucas and the two remaining rig workers trying to figure out how they can get off the rig because there are no communications, no electricity. At one point, they're trying to like get the generator to work, but that causes one of the guys to die. So they end up deciding... Oh, it's important to know, Josh Lucas told his wife, stay your ass on shore at this restaurant. I'll just be gone a few hours. But she's being harassed by one of the patrons. So she decides to run away and get on a boat and go to the rig <laughs> instead of just going anywhere else. They have a hotel reservation. They have a hotel reservation. They have a very nice car. The car ends up getting all the tires slashed. And then he even... I was confused by... We need to talk more about the whole like opening of the film. But Josh Lucas's family ends up on the rig. And they're all fighting for their lives. And in the end, the decision is made that because the crew workers are telling Josh Lucas, like, it's El Demonio Negro. And he's like, this is so stupid. Like, I don't believe in this. But he finally does, and they tell him, we need to offer a sacrifice. Basically, we need to blow the rig up. And the rig does have a bomb for, like, self-disintegration. And they use his white guilt against him. And so it becomes a suicide mission. He straps his bomb on his ass and somehow times the explosion of the bomb perfectly with this megalodon eating him. So we see the shark blow up, but his family, his wife, two kids, and the one remaining rig worker flee the rig safely. 
the end. Yes. Uh, the, the, with uh, ostensibly the rig is destroyed, uh, El Demonio Negro will leave, and uh, Inez, his wife, will get his pension. Yeah. So I guess she gets what she wanted in the first place. Because oh, they make mention of in the beginning, like that, him having this well-paying job is what helped provide for the. <laughs> and and this is a political metaphor, apparently, because he looked the other way. I there's I have so many notes. I did not like this movie. Uh, where to begin the dialogue? Mm-hmm. When we meet Josh Lucas and his family, they're in this car driving into Mexico to go to the rig. And the conversations they're having, particularly the kids, at one point the little boy tells his sister, the only pirate you know is on a bottle of Captain Morgan. Like, just everything they were saying felt so, like, unrealistic to me yes and the daughter oh i couldn't stand her she was so rude and insufferable Mm -hmm. and but thankfully once they get on the rig she kind of takes a back seat the only thing she offers up is prayer at one point which isn't really in keeping with her character no so the next thing i don't like is there's no tension set because the mood is so off we're supposed to think that this town they're visiting is like it's really supposed to be like a deserted town because the main industry which is this rig is not like, it's cursed, right? Like, like when that couple shows up on Who Could Kill a Child. <laughs> but then when we see the town, it's beautiful. It's like coastal Mexico. It looks like you just got off the cruise ship in, like, Cabo. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's really nice. And even when they're walking, we get this music, like, ominous, like, oh, he's about to approach some locals, and they don't like this gringo. And even where they're standing and the house they're next to is beautiful. Also, in the car, Inez, played by uh, Fernanda Urijola, who was recently in Cry Macho, is like telling the kids, we're in Mexico, let's speak Spanish. And then Josh Lucas proceeds to offend the locals by not speaking Spanish, by, by insistently asking if they speak English. It's like, so you were not going to talk to your husband then <laughs> during this trip? The, yeah, the use of uh, language is so odd. because it's, it's feel, It feels very arbitrary. So then it, it sets up this weird energy of like either Josh Lucas is being really obnoxious yes. in that he does speak Spanish, or really obnoxious because you married this woman and don't haven't bothered to learn any of her language but the kids do that's weird i mean that is a very familiar scenario though (laughs) but but he comes across as obnoxious and i also don't understand how much spanish he knows because at points he does understand but then he yeah it just feels josh lucas is also one of those people he's one of the only people i've seen in a film that's given nicholas cage a run for the camp money i liked him like as an actor i i I did like him on screen it seemed like he was having fun you need need to watch him in the secret dare to dream obvious opposite katie holmes so when they are talking to the locals trying to figure out like where to get a bite to eat the locals are all mad at him like you gringo and then the wife pops up like no i'm mexican and you know my i just want to bring my kids back to their heritage and you know you understand oh that was just so terribly written she takes out like a little wad of bills and stuff here for the community she does that like four times where she just hands a wad of money to someone like here shut up make it better so then these locals take them to a restaurant and on the way they stop at this shrine and the little boy sees like a little figurine mm-hmm. and he steals it and then in its place puts a Snickers bar. It's an offering. So they get to this restaurant and it's, I mean, it has the most beautiful view you've ever seen. The restaurant itself is kind of like a shanty, but it, it, it's large. And they're sitting there and the husband says, okay, well, I'll just be gone a few hours. You can go book a nicer hotel somewhere else if you want. I was so unclear what he thought they were going to do for these hours sitting at this restaurant that doesn't appear to have food available. And not eating. And, then he, and they're not eating. He pays the bartender to look after his family. This man walks up to this bartender and gives him a wad of money and says, look out for my family. What? What is he supposed to do? And then, of course, as soon as the dad leaves, some more locals come in and harass the wife. That's the movie telling us... The- so, <laughs> so then they're harassing her she hits one of them over the head with a bottle and she even yells at the bartender like is this what my husband paid you for so they run to the car tires are flat so instead so then she runs to the pier and then the guy from nacho libre no that's not him that's not him no you're right it's not him the guy from nacho libre uh takes josh lucas hector Jimenez. did you did you get catch his character name no chocolatito chocolatito <laughs> like is that a little chocolate <laughs> 
Is yes. that what that means? <laughs> so, so the mom and the two kids are running to the pier and she's telling the, the boat guy, like, I'll pay you to take me to the rig. And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm not taking you to the rig. But I'm thinking, like, if you're trying to get to safety, you could have just had this man take you to the next pier could, over. Could you take me just around the river bend then? Literally like, anyway. anywhere. Why would you take me to this rig that my husband, who's at work right now, told your ass to stay away from? That just made no and sense. And that boat swain clearly knows about Il Demonio Negro. And it's like, can't you say, like, no, I'm not going to take you there because there's a big shark. But the guy agrees and takes them. And then, of course, he, he gets eaten. The, the, the family almost gets eaten, but they get onto the rig. Of course. Oh, my God. So, speaking of dialogue, the little boy references Friends. Like, the TV show Friends. He does. There's, there's a Ross and Rachel reference. So, when they get to the rig... I believe it's the, the the daughter falls into the water. And what does she see? A million body parts floating in the water. Just hanging in sp- like suspended gravity. That made no sense. Even though the ocean moves, you know, and those would drift elsewhere. But it's okay. I believe it's Josh Lucas's character at one point. He's like, because the rig is in bad shape. And he goes, Jesus Christ. And then someone goes, no, the black demon. <laughs> Also, the film says that this is based on, like, Mexican lore. Oh, God. Well, we keep referencing, is it an Aztec god? Uh, Lalak, who the chi- the, sm- the small young boy keeps saying the name wrong, and he has to, keep- has to be Correct. corrected. There's a point where Josh Lewis, so there are two remaining rig workers, and one of them attempts to put- get the generator to work, but is unsuccessful and gets bitten in half by the shark. And, it- and then Josh Lucas finds the body floating, and he lifts up this body. One-handed, like he's Jason. That can't be possible. Or Michael Myers. That character yeah. didn't have enough strength to button up his shirt. I don't know how he lifted up half an adult man out of the water like that. He just goes, oop. <laughs> so then we're told that the shark, so the main rig worker, who I thought was fine. I don't think he fit the role, but he was fine. He explains that the shark is, like, playing with their minds. So at one point, like, Josh Lucas hallucinates. That was a lot. That he sees rescue vessels. Mm-hmm. And then he tells the guy, you can take your superstitious, uh, superstitious Aztec bullshit and shove it up your ass. Like, he's so disrespectful. And this is after knowing that you have signed off on this rig that is falling apart. So I was so confused why his character is acting like he's surprised that the rig is in bad shape. Josh Lucas gets up on this rig and is acting insane. Like, what's happening? What's going on? You've like been, an insane idiot. You've, yeah. been, you've been signing off on safety issues and weird things going on on this rig, but you're acting shocked that it's in complete disarray. I don't so the know. daughter's annoying as hell and then she's gone for like 45 minutes and then comes back and now she wants to pray. And the little boy, the only function little boy serves after stealing the figurine is when they get to the rig, he's in the locker room and someone has like a Rubbermaid bin on the top of the locker filled with those little figurines. And every shot of little boy is him looking at the figurines or touching his figurine. And then at a point, he takes some figurines and puts five of them on a little boat and sets it off adrift in the ocean. And it's important to know one of those little figurines falls off into the water. So at the very end of the film, we see that the five people (laughs) didn't make it because the dad died. So we're left with four, like the figurine. And the very final shot of the film is that boat floating in the ocean with the little four figurines like all of a sudden sinks to the bottom. So I guess the sacrifice to El Demonio Negro has been satisfied. That was so corny. It's just very stupid. And also that little boy, there is an open can (gasps) of what looks like SpaghettiOs already opened with- Mold, it looks like it's moldy too. I don't know, he takes a bite of it. (laughs) Can you imagine eating old, open, moldy chef player? I mean, that, that shit has so much preservatives in it. That's been open a while if there's mold in there. Probably. Oh. Okay, then towards the end. So the movie loses so much momentum and steam once um, it's revealed that um, Josh Lucas's character knew the rig wasn't safe. It just goes completely flat. And then we get this like environmental montage where we get clips of like oil spills and birds flying and fires and then Paul Josh Lucas's character talking about what he did and he realizes it's wrong 
Well, because this oil rig is what's is what summoned the demon. Oh, we didn't really talk about that. The, yeah, that El Demonio Negro has been summoned because the effects of this rig to its environment. So I don't. So. But that rig's been there a minute. But it's been there a long time. Also, the size of the shark seems wasted. Like you already mentioned, the the, the, the shark is huge. We only see it once out of the water when it kills the the boat guy who brought Paul's family to the rig. And that shark like jumps out of the water and the shark's mouth is bigger than the boat. So this shark is huge, like a yacht. So I don't understand why it needs to be that big because we really don't ever see it do anything with its size. And then all of the shots of the shark after that are underwater. They're very close up with the shark moving by very quickly. I will say compared to a movie like Man Eater, the effects are decent. Like, I never laughed at, like, how silly the shark looks. It's just, like, why have the shark be the size of a, a yacht? And then it really doesn't accomplish much, except bump into the rig a lot and eat a couple people that we see. They all needed, they, they needed Jason Statham to get in there and get that Meg. Well, Meg was weak, too. Meg, Meg. No, Meg's terrible. This made me want to rewatch something real <laughs> sleazy, though, like Tincho Rara. <laughs> then, when Paul, Josh Lucas's character, decides that he's going to sacrifice himself... He gets on his little walkie-talkie to talk to his family on the boat as they're leaving for safety. And he's talking to each one. That was so corny. Like, so beyond corny. I don't have anything else to say. This... I'm so disappointed that... You are? I mean, I... Because most... Even, like, the worst shark movies. Like, I'll get on Tubi and watch a movie you have never heard of. And even there are moments where it's like, oh, that is creepy. This movie doesn't have any tension... The way the rig is shot, it's very close up, so I didn't even feel like I was in the middle of the ocean. The shark is very close up. It, it almost looks more like a whale. Mm -hmm. So then it didn't feel scary. Yeah, it's a miss for me. Oh, for sure. Ugh. What would you give it's it? Sure. A one is being really nice. A one. I'm only giving it one and not point five because I do feel like the effects are better than something like Maneater and... They did try to have a story. And it did give you the name for your autobiography. El Demonio Negro. <laughs> Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.